Hey everybody, welcome back to Word Balloon. If you enjoy the videos here, please consider liking the video, subscribing to the Word Balloon YouTube channel, and uh, of course, if you enjoy the audios and the videos, you can subscribe to my Patreon page, patreon.com slash Word Balloon. StreamYard like, link opened as well. This is, this is the look I put together for my on-camera. This was hours of interview. There were beer trimmings involved, uh, mooses, and... Uh, <laughs> Vidal says soon is behind me. Yeah, behind is, you know, is I, doing product. Vidal says soon gets my money a lot, <laughs> but uh, behind me, like I'm one of these people when I move in, I unpack over a series of years, you know. And uh, this was just piles of boxes, and I sort of like realized I was going to be on camera, and I had to fill the frame up with something. So I started to like strategically put things around me, so it looks very contrived. Did you really do that? That's because, hilarious, man. Well, it was just a pile of garbage behind me, and I was like, I got to consider what's in this frame. And, and and reassure everybody that the body we see behind you is, uh, what oh. is that? Oh, this is a good uh, Matrix. Uh, you remember Matrix 3? Sure. Yeah, right. So there's all the, the Smiths. Wow. So I've got an Agent Smith here. That's amazing, Steve. That's incredible. I'm so glad we're doing video. Tool here. And so in, in the scene, they're all standing next to each other. And so it's mostly these guys. Wow. A little handle back here that gets so you can turn his head. <laughs> so those are one of my gifts. Oh, oh my it's, God. You take very good care of it. Steve, that's incredible. Seriously, man. Oh, oh my God. Well, welcome to Word Balloon, my man. It's great Thank to see you. you. Thank you. Yeah, you too. It's been a while. Absolutely. And, well, and, and several uh, previous graphic novels that we should probably acknowledge or collected arcs. Uh, as well yeah. since our last conversation. Um, but let's talk about the uh, the thing at hand, and that's uh, Maestro, first issue. Now, obviously, with the Diamond pause, uh, any, you know, like, was it supposed to come out in May? You know, tell us when the release was supposed to be. Oh, Maestro came out a couple couple years ago now. <laughs> what did you send me? Is that what you sent me? Uh, did I send you something? You sent me Maestro. Oh, uh, oh well, the most recent thing I've had out is the Doc Frankenstein collection. Oh, that's great. Yeah, which finally came out, which is a great big fancy book, which is this, that you can, you can get in your store. And that collects the entire series, and it has 60-plus uh, brand-new pages that finish the story, uh, written by the Wachowskis. And, uh, yeah, we took, took our time with that one. I mean, hilariously slow, so we took a long time. But... Uh, yeah, but my uh, Maestro's was um, the last thing I did with Image, and then now I'm working on this post-apocalyptic adventure. Uh, sort of shifting it's the coronavirus. Yeah. Well, I tell you, it's kind of weird to uh, be working on something like that while we're going through this, because all the sort of themes and questions that your make-believe characters are dealing with are suddenly, like, mapped onto reality, and it feels a bit strange, you know? Like, oh. what will the new age be after, you know this event and uh what values will carry through into the you know post world maybe you know, maybe the comics a little more dramatic than uh, than reality but it's pretty dramatic out there yeah well and again you know and I, it's funny because i think that's been one of the recurring themes talking to creators is how will this influence post apocalyptic kind of stories and you know what what you know again i mean we're sadly well, i mean good lord we're living omega man Will people want less Walking Dead or more? In the I may say, at the beginning of this, it feels like you look at the next Netflix top ten, at least here in Canada. It's you know Shaun of the Dead, Pandemic. Uh, it was a bunch of uh, post-apocalyptic dystopian stuff was um, catching people's interest, but you know who knows? Maybe we'll just want Will Ferrell comedies next month. Exactly. Well, I saw on Roku early on that they were promoting uh, Outbreak, the Dustin Hoffman pandemic movie. And I'm like, is this a good time to do that? <laughs> In drama strain. Exactly. Yes. Good Lord. Absolutely, man. Or The Happening, the M. Night Shyamalan. Wasn't that like some sort of... <laughs> Was that a pandemic? I thought the Earth had just turned on us. I don't remember. You know, honestly, I don't remember. And I wasn't sure. I and mean, this could very well be the Earth turning on us as well. well. You know, you had told me, uh, I think the last time we were talking, that you guys were putting together the Doc Frankenstein uh, collection. And and you had told me then too that you were adding pages and stuff. So that's that's amazing. Burley Man Comics, the Wachowskis' former imprint. Yes. 
and yeah. Uh, yeah. It's kind of we've sort of we finally pushed out our baby, and now it's um, you know now we're kind of uh, you know it's on permanent maternity leave now that uh, Frankenstein's out. That's outstanding, man. I uh, no, that's great. Well, and again, this is great because I do want to point people to existing collected arcs or graphic novels and stuff. And uh, you know, hey, this is a great way to support your local store. Is yep. column for Doc Frankenstein, and again, um, significant good. book when it was coming out, man. It was, yeah. We look, we fumbled the ball. I mean, if you want to be in comics, you got to be all in, and our heart was definitely there. But believe it or not, there's a business side to this as well. And uh, you know, there was like, there's no real company. It was just like one guy we had kind of doing everything, and sometimes you know what I mean. It was just a very unrealistic. Um, uh, enterprise is a business, uh, but we, uh, you know, the, the Wachowskis, one of their uh, father-in-laws was the printer and, uh, you know. Crazy. Of, you know, it was a lot of kind of, uh, it was more akin to say, you know, a bunch of friends, soccer moms, uh, heading down to Pottery Barn to make some stuff than like a legit comic company, you know. <laughs> it was you, it was you, it was the Wachowskis. Uh, also, Jeff Darrow was doing Shaolin Cowboy. Yeah, through Darren, that and everything, and uh, the Wachowskis, the four of us, yeah, yeah. So, no, it was fun. Well, it was cool, man. And again, you know, you guys were riding the the Matrix wave, and you know, uh, we loved all the stuff that you did for the movies and everything. So, uh, yeah, and again, I think great ideas, both Doc Frankenstein and uh, Shaolin Cowboy. Yeah, Shaolin is still going. Jeff is still working on it. I talk to Jeff all the time. He's like my best friend. So, um, yeah. We'll see more of that soon. I moved. I moved into the city, and I uh, I don't live too far from him, and I haven't I haven't seen him in a while. And uh, he's always he's he did like two or three really good conversations with me, and he's like, "Oh, we've talked enough, John. We don't have to do this." <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, "It's cool, Jeff. It's no problem. As long as we can talk in conventions, I'm okay with that." But I miss having him on because he's he's always great interest in like, interesting ideas. Is- you can never get tired of talking to him because he's had this amazing uh, life and he's had like this, he has this uh, amazing, uh, I don't know if you call it a rogues gallery, but he has a lot of famous fans that he like hooks me up with. Like uh, last month, uh, right at the start of the Corona thing, I got this like FaceTime call from him and he was in, he's moved to Paris since the last time you spoke to him. Oh, yeah. I didn't know he moved back uh, to Paris. That's amazing. Uh, just outside of, uh, of in the, I'd say a couple hour train ride. He told okay. Me. Wow. Okay. And, um, yeah, so he's at this con. He so I get this Facetime call, and it's uh, fucking Jack Black, Jack Black is on the phone. Hilarious. And I'm like looking at Jack Black, and I'm like, well, this is strange. And uh, <laughs> you know, Darrow, he's a fan of Darrow's, and invited Darrow and his daughter out to the Tenacious D concert in Paris. And uh, you know, wow, but uh, yeah. that's amazing, man. No, that's that's really cool. Good lord, did you talk to him about Tenacious D stuff or? It was a FaceTime call, and if you can imagine, just like the height of awkwardness, and he's trying to create like a positive experience for a fan, and I'm like, you know, uh, half awake and uh, <laughs> morning, you know, and it's like ten o'clock their time, and uh, so it was awkward, of course. Uh, but, That's nice though. There you yeah, go, Jeff. Jeff's looking up for you. Hilarious. Uh, anyway, well, yeah. All right, so I was confused, and did Maestro? Did you finish your maestro story? I that's sure, what I was uh, there's plans for other stories, but the first arc is, you know, the first issue was double sized, so it's about eight issues worth of comics. Uh, you know, it's in trade now. Came out last year. The trade. Uh, we were nominated for best new series. Okay. Uh, you know, colored by the amazing Dave Stewart and um, uh, Phonographics is the uh, the lettering and uh, graphic design, which is amazing and. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's come and gone, and, and then my idea was to like really pivot quickly uh, to a post-apocalyptic book. Um, more just because I had like that story. I had a couple stories in my mind that were kind of more fully cl- cooked than a second Maestro's arc, and I like the idea of changing genres. And so I did that, and then, yeah, that's of course instead of being a quick pivot, it's you know wasted months, but. Uh, but I got four issues of it done, and uh, that's what I'm working on now. It'll come out in the uh, uh, the next age. Okay, I understand. Whatever we call post-corona. I understand. Yeah, when we are all out of the great thaw. 
my, we come back. my fantasy that keeps me going is that because no one will go to sporting events, concerts, and uh, movies, is that uh, all the lapsed readers will come back to comics and, uh, you know. Exactly. This is something you could do social distance wise and everything and still enjoy. You're right. Sure. That's hilarious. TMZ will be chasing uh, Tom King, the great at a distance. Or <laughs> Outstanding. Oh, all right, for people. Batman art. What's that? Oh, exactly. Was... Yeah, oh, Tom. <laughs> Tom. Exactly. What are you doing with Adam Strange, Tom? <laughs> the yeah. uh, remind people. For uh, about Doc Frankenstein that maybe you know weren't there for the first uh, time around and everything, and you know give us the elevator pitch on Doc Frankenstein. Sure, it's um, the concept and idea came from Jeff Darrow, and myself and the Wachowskis fell in love with it. And uh, you know initially Darrow and I had started doing it, and the Wachowskis kind of just came in and said, "Let us in on it," and we just kind of let them take. They had just such an amazing idea for this. Basically, it's all based on Jeff's idea, but they kind of uh, you know did this their great, great version of it. And, uh, yeah, so it's the Frankenstein's monsters, but he, but he's lived, um, after we, in the novel, he's left behind on the ice. We assume he's dead, but in our story, we're saying that didn't happen. What actually happens is he spent some time in solitude and then finally meets some human beings and it changes his perspective. And he winds up going to the old West and becoming a bounty hunter there. Um, we learn that he's kind of immortal because of the procedure that brought him back to life. And he's super smart and he becomes, uh, you know, kind of this, what ultimately becomes like this figure in American history that's uh, there during uh, uh, the Wild West days up until present time. And so he's kind of a, uh, you know, to the dispossessed of the world, he's a, uh, you know, lauded figure, uh, but to certain power structures. And in our story, this twisted version of the Catholic Church, he's like the, this uh the ultimate enemy that has to be erased that's awesome man yeah i again now and as you describe it it's like oh yeah oh that's right oh yes okay and so yeah how many how many uh pages did you go ahead and drink don't worry i don't want to keep you from drinking how many how many uh yeah how many pages i guess in the are there story-wise in the collection let's see um or whatever how many issues was it you know it took 15 years to get it done so i'm a, Fifteen years in the making, everybody. Yeah, that's harsh. Uh, I don't know. It's a lot because some of the issues, like they would just write, like some of the issues are twenty-five, twenty-six pages, twenty-eight, and it's like I don't know. Like uh, it's a lot. It's this big. Yeah, that's no. It's a good sized thing. And then, so the additional pages were they other stories or were they process pages and pinups or what? what you know, what they were like. It was planned for because we fumbled the ball. They decided, they kind of, you know, started to become unfun. So we just, rather than, we did what every comic fan likes, you know, you collect up to a certain amount. And uh, rather than publishing the last two or three issues, we just put them in the uh, collection. Okay, cool. Uh, so the poor collector who was with us kind of gets the shaft, but, uh, you know, sorry. I mean, I, that's what I'm happened. I'm glad you did this, man. I mean, this is great because, good Lord, I, I was buying the issues individually. I will absolutely buy this graphic novel. That's fantastic. Sure. Well, I can send you one. I can send you one. Oh, well, thanks, yeah. man. You're lovely. Yeah. That's that's right. You sure. know, seriously, send me a PDF because, like, give it, you know, like, sell that thing when we, you know, when we need to and stuff. That's that's your currency, man. 25, five bucks, bucks off. I mean, <laughs> that's a terrible joke. No, terrible. That's good. No, I like it. I like all of this, man. Got it free, pal. Um, yeah, what else can I say about it? Yeah, it's action-packed. They talk about um, controversial. There is we do the secret history of Jesus Christ in it, which was always a bit blasphemous, maybe more than a bit. And um, you know, uh, I guess depending where you stand on that uh, religiously, uh, your religious beliefs, you know, the uh, offensive it'll be. Um, yeah, we reveal that Jesus was kind of, you know, trained by fairies. They're the ones who taught him how to, uh, you know, the magic stuff, water into wine and whatnot. And, uh, yeah, I'll let people read it. It gets pretty blasphemous, actually. <laughs> so, it, you know, Yah we meet Yahweh, who is ultimately, you know, the um, Judeo-Christian God. We find out about his origins. It all ties in nicely to the story uh, with Frankenstein. It's this crazy. Crazy. 
Yeah, man. Well, again, subversive stuff. And this is like kind of your wheelhouse as far as subversive. subversive. And that's why I was telling you about, you know, I read that first issue of Maestro today before we talked and really enjoyed it. And again, another, I would say Maestro sits very nicely. I mean, right now, one of the buzz sci-fi books out there is, um, and now I'm blanking, Money Shot from Vault with uh, Tim Seeley and Sarah Beatty writing it and oh, Rebecca I- Isaacs drawing it. And, you know, it's, you know, very sexified in a good way, in a funny way. And it's, you know, this group of scientists. It's kind of a cross between crowdfunding scientists and Star Trek where they are going out and shooting their uh, interspecies sexual ex- escapades to raise money to do research for their science. So you got like five Captain Kirks out there, men and women, that are like finding the green people and sure, let's get down and, it, and broadcasting it over the galaxy to make money. Well, I don't think uh, Maestro's is not that sexy. You know, right. Mostly uh, 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 making fun of toxic masculinity. And what's funny is the first issue is really the only one that's like that. Okay. We do have, uh, there's a kind of a callback to the, uh, um, what do you want to call it? Uh, there's some male the oil- in it. Uh, this kind of a call a call back to that a dick the, joke. the oil man the because uh, I think I stepped in while you were talking there call back well, to just that situation yeah to the uh, sort of the, the the dick joke that uh, I hang the first issue on <laughs> this is a magical being that might be the grandson of God uh, he is uh, the son of uh, Mitra Kazar who is the, uh, the Khazars, as it turns out, created the universe and everything in it. That's what they tell you. And he's kind of, you know, the, an, uh, the ultimate bastard. You know, he's he kind of, he's like a king, but he con- controls all reality and uh, all magic. And the earth is kind of like this um, vacation world that, that he created where they withheld all the magic just to kind of see what would happen. And what happens, what grows up in its place uh, magic is sort of the standard throughout all the all reality, all the universe, the multiverse. Most worlds have some more a version of it that was withheld on Earth, and and the result is kind of we grew, uh, we developed our technology and uh, ingenuity and, and things like that. And so our, uh, uh, you know, William Little, who's the you know protagonist of the story, is uh, one of many children. He's the Mitra Kazar, uh, the maestro has a myriad of wives and hundreds of children, and he's kind of the black sheep, the least light uh, of, of all of them. And he's sort of on Earth banished, and what happens is an ancient enemy returns and destroys the maestro and the entire family at a family reunion that he wasn't invited to. And so the, the throne falls to, to him. And he's just like kind of a millennial guy who's, uh, you know, thinks he knows something, but he doesn't really. <laughs> So the first arc, four issues, five issues? It was seven issues, but seven. eight issues worth of comics. First issue was double size, so yeah. Cool. And that's, and that's out now. Plugging away. That's yeah. awesome, man. There you go. So cool. that's Maestro and uh, Maestros. And um, and again, Doc Frankenstein. So there's two great new uh, books from Steve that uh, everybody should uh, certainly consider. That's that's and, outstanding. And I'm guard with, uh, from Brian Vaughn and I. Which kind of I, like I, yes, sir. And you know something? Last time we talked, and I wanted to talk about On Guard. We stand on guard. Um, an amazing, great idea. And I want you to describe that book. We talked about it at the last conversation, but I think you were just getting started with that. That's how long it's been. Yeah. So let's let's talk about that. I remember that conversation. I was in the middle of doing my taxes, and as usual, I, I got the times mixed up. So I had to move over from like figuring out how much money I owed to like being charismatic all of a sudden. And pitching it was I don't think I listened to it. But anyway, We Stand on Guard is kind of is a futuristic sci-fi military thriller. Uh the bones of it are kind of like um Red Dawn. If you remember that film, there were the John Millius film. I think they did a remake last year. Yep. And uh so yeah, so the Canadians are kind of like the uh the Americans hiding from the Russians. So there's a, a group of civilian um freedom fighters up in the uh, north um, and they are, uh, you know, uh, fighting basically uh, 
a much more advanced military force. It's kind of like America is it's giant robots and drones and, uh, you know, every, you know, sci-fi mechanical trope, you know, made real is kind of the concept, you know. But the Americans are the antagonists. Yeah, the Americans have invaded us, you know, uh, ostensibly. We attack them. The Canadians attack them in, in Brian's story, but, uh, you know, uh, whether that you know, whether that was a false flag attack or not is kind of ambiguous. Uh, but either way, they come and they sort of, you come, John. I know. You, I'm sorry. I'm the big bad, literally. You take our water. Hey, man, you've been hoarding it, all right? We need, our, we need the water more than you do. Come on. Well, the thing is, we would just, really, we would just give it to you. I think Nestle <laughs> gets 10,000 gallons for every penny or something, and they, well, that's the water they... they that you buy in their bottles. <laughs> what was that candy? Was it candy in a movie where they were invading uh, Canada? Then there was like a whole thing, and Alan Alda was in it. Schlocky movie, not a good movie. Oh well, you're talking about Michael Moore's uh, only comedy, uh, Canadian Bacon. Canadian Bacon, absolutely. Yeah, John, Can I'm like John Candy's last film, even that. Maybe. Right. Yes. Yeah. No, you have to see. They show that in schools here. Uh, <laughs> Why? <laughs> <It's not true. laughs> that was outstanding. Jeez. Dude, I'm so freaking gullible. That's excellent. That was awesome. Good jam. <laughs> you know what? Yeah, I'll tell you. All right. I'll tell you a so so John Candy movie that I've come to love is Only the Lonely, the movie mm. you made with Ali Sheedy, that basically is the basis for Mike and Molly. Mm. It's, it's, it's the same writer, and I believe they just retooled it for TV, where really? he's a Chicago cop and she's a. A makeup person at a funeral parlor, and they they fall in love, and uh, no, it's very sweet. Plus size. What's that? She's not plus size. She's just kind of skinny. No, oh no, no. She's. I mean, yeah. It's. I mean, it's. It's like when Jim Belushi gets Courtney Thorne Smith. It's like, yeah, only in television. Sure, sure, yeah. that'll happen. You know, of course. Real Jim Belushi. <laughs> <laughs> Jim Belushi also in only the lonely as John Candy's cop partner. So oh, I mean I, I I probably like it a lot because it's Southside Chicago, Ferdinand O'Hara. That's my favorite Jim Belushi cop partner movie. Which K nine or which one? Red Heat. Red Heat, of course. Schwarzenegger, absolutely. Which really started the trend of uh, nude bathhouse fights as well. <laughs> Eastern They're, Promises. Of they've course. Tried, no, Eastern Promises tried, but uh, you know, Red Heat was superior. Arnold lost his towel. <laughs> and Arnold had that awesome. Uh, Ivan Drago buzz right. cut and everything. Yeah, that's my jam. Pretty much all '80s movies is the media diet that I I draw upon for anything I do. Really. <laughs> do you know Mike North or Mike North? Mike Norton, the cartoonist. Uh, I know of him, but uh, yeah, I have very I don't know very many people. I spent so many time years in movies. I kind of right out on meeting other cartoonist friends. Sadly. He he and Tim Seeley are all about schlocky 80s action movies. And, uh, you know, and I'm not even going to try and remember. Was it ex The Exterminator with Robert Ginty? That one I don't know. Okay. All right. There you go. Um, Sound like, sounds like they went on a deeper dive than I did. <laughs> Maybe. You know, I was in Canada in the 80s. We didn't get as much stuff as you, you know. <laughs> hey, you know, we were talking about a Canadian product. Uh, as Tim Seeley and I remember that animated movie, Rock and Rule. Hell yeah! I've got the comic book to that. Did you know it's all screen grabs from the uh, from the film? And yep. uh, yeah, I coveted that. I thought it looked. Uh, it's very well animated. It's a fun movie, and it's a shame that it didn't. I mean, literally, it didn't even make a hundred grand. I think uh, in North America when it was finally released and everything. And I remember seeing it on uh, video shelves back in the nineties. And Tim Seeley and I did a deep dive talking about it, and uh, I I love it. And in fact. Um, I've I've been doing I do another podcast with Art Baltazar and Franco of Tiny Titans fame, and we've been watching we've been doing our own mystery science theater kind of riff, watching bad movies and making fun of them and stuff. And I keep pushing for rock and roll because I think that would be a lot of fun to do. Hmm, that's a good one. Yeah, the eighties, <laughs> the iconic idiot. That one, uh, Fire and Ice, was the one that, uh, was the other one that kind of was super important to me as a kid. You know, sure, love that. I looked at that guy. I looked at uh, what's his name, the Frazetta Panther mask wearing guy, and I was like, "That's Wolverine." I was obsessed with that. <laughs> That's awesome. And you know, Roy Thomas and Jerry Conway, I guess, helped uh, write the script. Oh, really? Fire and Ice. Oh, yeah. yeah. Hmm. Oh. 
the more you know. Absolutely, man. Too goddamn funny. I uh, um, well, you know, and it, here now again, more Burly Man stuff because I believe were the Matrix comics under the Burly Man imprint, or was that after? Uh, when it was printed and brought yeah. out, it was under yeah. the yeah, it was, and they that just came out too. I put that book around here. I was wondering because oh. yeah, Steve, those those comics are so great, and really, I, I had just gotten back into reading comics. Uh, and maybe, uh, in fact, they were probably in their first trades. I didn't catch them in individual issues. But my God, it knocked me out. What? There we go, ladies and gentlemen, the Matrix comics. Yeah, for some reason, I don't have one, and I didn't do one. Oh, this is all, is that all? Because, like, yeah, they well, had a lot of different... comics initially were like a uh, collection of short stories in support of... Uh, so it's really like, um, what do you call it, an anthology of... It's yeah. a lot of different stories by everyone, and... Uh, but I, I, there was plans for me to do one, and then I can't remember what happened, but never got around to it. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, and likely we talked about that in our in our previous conversation. Is um That just came out, though. That just came out, like, last month. That's awesome. And again, there's something else for people to pick up. Uh, you know, how are the Wachowskis? Are they are they done with movies? What's, what's, what's their status? Uh, Matrix 4. They're making Matrix 4. Of course they are. I, t- I totally forgot about that. That's yeah, great. Yeah. Well, it's shut down right now. Uh, right. Well, Lisa Wachowski has her own show on uh, Showtime. Uh, but Talana is the only is, is, is writing and directing the new one. Okay. Uh, are you are you working on uh, conceptual stuff for him? Yeah, like Jeff and I, we, it was actually a great gift uh, to kind of go back and revisit all that. So we went out to... Uh, Lana lives in San Francisco, and so they got some office space and they brought down a bunch of artists and Jeff and I were put in an office together again, uh, which we hadn't done since 2000. Well, no, no, I guess Jupiter was the last time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jupiter ascending. Yeah. 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 Ascending. So yeah, it was a great experience. This last summer we spent a few months put me behind in my comic that I'm doing with image. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was amazing to return uh, spending like, you know, I was really young when they dra- they dragged me into the Matrix. I was like 21, 22 or something. And, uh, yeah, it was re- meeting Jeff and working with them. You know, it was just a highlight of my creative life, you know. Really sure. put me on a different path, being in a room with, uh, with Jeff. Uh, probably would have been better if they had put me in a room with someone who drew faster. I'd probably draw faster now. But still... I'm just kidding. It uh, <laughs> it was amazing working, uh, going back and uh, being in an office with him, and uh, just the laughs. As you know, he's a super funny guy, and uh, yeah, it was really great being with Lana and a bunch of you know just people you've known for years that you haven't seen, and you get back to go hang out again. And sure, you're there for the work, but it's also for just going over dinner. And um, it was nice to enjoy more. When I was younger, I was so such a nervous guy. You know, I never really enjoyed my time in Hollywood because I was always a little edgy. And now you get older, I don't really, you know, a little more relaxed. Just appreciated, was able to appreciate the time more this this time. That's cool. Is the, I mean, in the, as you're describing this and stuff, going from movie to movie, is there a different vibe? Uh, or is it literally, no, it's just same company, same people. We're just working, we're making something different. Well, going from... Well, from the Matrix movies, um, I guess Lana's style is a little, you know, there's she's, you know, there's so many skills they acquire over time. So, you know, she's even more uh, on top of things and quicker. She knows how to work faster now, and uh, um, so there's more, maybe more tools in her to- toolbox. But from my point of view, like I've worked on a bunch of movies, you know, over the last fifteen years, and. Um, the Wachowskis, you can't. The problem with working with the Chelsea's is it's just as an artist on a film, it's hard to go up, uh, go up from there. You don't get, you know, on their films, you kind of get elevated status as the artist. You sort of feel like you're in the band. They love working with the artist. Uh, you know, they like to hang out with them, and um, yeah, it's just a more. It's a very collaborative experience. And um, on other movies, sometimes it'll be I've worked for months by myself in a room, essentially designing a giant graphic novel for one person to see, you know, and then the movie doesn't get made or you work on like, you know, something that's, you wouldn't want to see, but it's a job. You know what I mean? Sure. And, um, so yeah, like that's, that's the problem with the Wachowskis is it's too good. Um, I'm hip. 
Yeah, well, and again, coming from comics, they appreciate they appreciate the art. And I mean, man, you know, just the things you guys invented for for the three Matrix movies. I can't imagine what you guys are working on with uh, the fourth movie. Um, who give me some other. Uh, it, you know, and again, you don't have to say it was a bad or good experience. It was some of the other films that we would have seen uh, in between. Uh, like I did, I Robot was one. There's uh, I Robot was one I did that was in Vancouver. That's a really old movie now. And um, Will Smith, sure, sure, Will Smith. And um, oh, one, oh, this is a movie. It's funny. I had this period over a few years where I worked on all these movies and none of them got made, but they would be like you know for six months. So one of the the highlights, the movie never got made, is I got to work on the. Um, George Miller Justice League film and uh, that was wild that was like got to go down to Australia it was the same production designer of Matrix and so he hired me for it and uh, yeah, that was just amazing because it was right around the time they were doing the new 52 as well and okay. we were doing kind of the same things uh, that they were ultimately doing and they were saying the same conversations like what can you change about the characters what do you have to keep and um, how do you make them different? You'd sit in these big, this big meeting room with George Miller, and you would, you know, initially you would have the room full of people, like a lot of people for the production. The artists would be there. You would have other people from other departments, and there'd be like kind of a an overall conversation of like what people thought about the characters. Certain questions, like the one thing they realized is like the thing about the DC characters that the Marvel characters don't suffer from is they kind of have similar powers in the DC universe. The Justice League, you know, Martian Manhunter, Superman kind of have the same powers. Yes. Especially when you're trying to make them all distinct visually for a film. Uh, you know, the Flash is fast, you know. Um, Superman is fast as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Green Lantern. Um, the Wonder Woman at that time, I think she was flying around, too. So she kind of felt like Superman. Um, but, yeah, it was like also like you know, Superman's costume. Like, what do you what can you change? Okay, we'll take the shorts off. And it was funny. They um, did they did they make you take the shorts off or watch it gone? Um, not too different than what wound up in the movie of the sex. I don't Well, different. Yeah. Like, Man of Steel. In a wheelhouse, you know, uh, sure. Kind of streamlined it. They had a lot of cool little elements that they added. But the one thing they decided on that you couldn't change that they did change for the new 52 was you couldn't mess with the mantle which was this part. You had to have the bare neck and the red cape, and but the DC, they put the collar on. And I remember there were a bunch of versions of the drawings and they had a bunch of Superman with collars and George Miller was like, no, it's not right. You know, yeah. He always has to have his mantle, you know? That's awesome. Well, again, when they made that redesign in New 52, I'm like, it's Monel's uniform with Superman's colors and shield. And I'm like, and and they even got rid of the spit curl. And I'm like, this is Monel cosplaying as Superman. This this isn't. It just didn't feel like Superman. No, I agree. And I'll I'll tell you, man, I was a big proponent of the shorts. I was very happy when the shorts came back. You know, <laughs> I got to be honest. It's like, you like on, man, circus acrobats. That's what it is. It's not his underwear on the outside. That's what acrobats wore back then. Well, look, I'm I'm with it too. But you know, if he's going to wear shorts, we have to show that they're for a purpose. It has to be story driven. So he should have to stop and use the bathroom or something. <laughs> I told Bendis he should have done a story where literally Superman is just going through the fortress, opening drawers and getting into like closets and stuff. And it'd be like a great eight page story of excuses of just having great kind of splash page panels of, oh, yeah, this is the ray gun I used to beat Mongol. And, oh, this is that mind thing Luther tried to use on me. And then finally him going. Oh, there they are. And then you walk out, he's got the shorts on and stuff. And that's, you know. Yeah, he just misplaced them. <laughs> I like that idea, too. <laughs> See, I'm here, and then I'm here he to help. Up and you realize at the back there's a hole where his bum is. And I... <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot of wear and tear on those shorts when he's out fighting crime. You can appreciate that. That's sure. awesome. So did they, were there alternate powers then for Martian Manhunter to make him different? It was more just kind of, um, hmm, how did they do it? Like, they focused more on, like, his shape-shifting rather than strength or power. And they said, yeah. you know, he, could, he couldn't be as fast. So they didn't really focus on his own super speed, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, scene by scene, you would just try to find ways to individuate them, you know? Yeah. Uh, and uh, what else was in there? They had, uh, Weta did this, like, super sexy sculpt sculpture of... Um, of uh, Martian Manhunter. I've got copies of this stuff everywhere, but like I said, I moved, so don't 
Was it around here? No. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it was a super sleek, you know, he had a tiny little waist. He looked, you know, maybe nine heads tall, really broad shoulders, all this, you know, ornate filigree and stuff in the, in the costume. But it looked like Martian Man, the best version I've seen of him. But then George Miller, this is one of maybe the flubs of the movie. Enough years have passed, I think. So the guy they cast was Immortum Joe, that's in uh, Fury Road, also in the original Mad Max, right, as a toe cutter. Yep. For him. But he's an older gentleman now and quite heavy. He was quite heavy set, as you, you know. And so he's uh, he didn't match up to the uh, maquette of the... Uh, so, but they made this foam rubber outfit of him, and he kind of looked like, you know, like if the thing got the flu or something, you know. He was like all green and didn't look like... He was like in the best shape, you know. Didn't look very healthy. <laughs> I can see the Warner's execs looking at that, going, "Hmm, well, I don't know. We should probably, uh, you know." Was there was there any second tier Justice League heroes that were like going to be a surprise and that you wouldn't think of the obvious well, core of the group? They had the great ending where you meet Barry Allen and they set up Kid Flash. And what happens is Barry Allen kind of sacrifices himself at the end of this story. Oh, and wow. Like crisis. That's really, yeah. well, that was probably the best thing about it. It wasn't quite the fans Justice League, but the heart was there where the, the Zack Snyder movie kind of looked the part. I feel like those characters really feel like Jim Lee drawings jumping off the page. But uh, the DNA was a bit tampered with, with uh, Batman being alt-right and uh, a fascist and, uh, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah, it was. Yeah. yeah. It, well, yeah. I mean, it, again, and also with the best intentions, getting Joss Whedon to finish the film and do a recut and everything. But it's 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 its own Doc Frankenstein that movie. I mean, it's, it's a you hot, literally can see the seams. You know, it's kind of a little late to suddenly say in that movie after the melancholy previous movies that now he's this figure of hope and uh, the costumes brighter and yeah. I didn't love that movie. No, no, neither did I, man. I, I, Man of Steel, I think initially the whole him killing Zod at the end bothered me. That aside, I do think there were a lot of good things in Man of Steel. I loved when he was on that uh, oil derrick, uh, yeah. you know, and saving people and stuff. I thought all that was – all that wandering portion of the movie I thought was really, really interesting. Um, and, and all the, man, they got Krypton right. I thought – or not right, but just a great uh, choice of what they did with Krypton, I thought. Well, there was a distinct vision, and they carried it through to the end. Um, how you felt about Superman, I was sort of mixed about it. I mean, totally, even that movie, like, you know, they bring uh, Metropolis, they turn it into rubble, and then that's the moment where Lois has the kiss with Clark, and it was, uh, <laughs> there's just bodies hanging out of windows and stuff in the back. They should have been. Uh <laughs> Because of all, you know, they cratered that whole city. It was, it was. Uh, oh, it was worse than nine eleven. Absolutely, my God. And I, I also appreciated images. Say, say it again, Steve. I keep stepping. They were on directly it. drawing upon that nine eleven stuff, which is like, uh, I don't know. It's a bit well, much for a fun superhero movie. Well, that's the thing, man. Again, they they tried to set such a serious tone, and uh, I, I did like the way they used it in Batman v Superman, at least as a. Uh, for, honestly, what I wanted to see, and again, shame on me, I'm writing my own movie rather than accepting a movie, what they're trying to do. I had no problem with like Batman seeing the fight and being like, hey, maybe we need to stop this guy. I would have had a much more saner Lex Luthor in the way that uh, Brian Azzarello and Lee Bermejo did a great Lex Luthor miniseries called Man of Steel. And right. one, of the, one of the comics was Luthor and Bruce Wayne sitting down and Luthor appealing to Bruce Wayne and saying – we don't know who this guy is. He's an alien. How how can we trust him? What could go wrong? And I think if they had pro approached that with, in Batman Superman rather than the way they did it, I think it would have had a little more um, – you would have understood why Batman was a little more paranoid uh, as opposed to what we got. The problem with it was like there's the line that he says that kind of where I locked – where I where that wasn't my, Batman to me where he says that there's – a one per, I think it's if there's a one percent chance that this guy is our enemy, we have to de destroy him. And he would really say the opposite. If there's a one percent chance that he's not, then we can't destroy. Him, you know? Right. No, I agree. And again, yes, it is. It is that I never thought of it as all right, but I do agree with you in terms of 
he was definitely a little more. I don't know what the word would be, a direct and, and you know, well, echoes of Frank this, Miller. You know, he wasn't really there to help people. He's there to punish people. There's that weird opening scene where, like, he's just hanging around waiting for that cop to to scare the cop or something. I don't know. And then he, like, almost blows his friend friend's head off. <laughs> you know what I, you know what I mean? <laughs> I don't remember that, but I remember him branding the one crook with the... Yeah, uh... that's kind of, like, sadistic. I yeah. mean, I guess if you really want to unpack Batman, like, you know, if you really want to take the modern lens and look at him, he's, he's it's a little, you know, rich guy beating up poor people is um, tough. Um, but, you know, the, the, I love the Christopher Nolan movies had a real way, a smart way of dealing with all that. And no one likes The Dark Knight Rises, but. Uh, I don't mind it. I mean, it wasn't a perfect movie, but I, there's good stuff in there. It has dumb stuff in it, but it has the, you know, all the batman things I like, you know, where he crawls out of the hole and Creed does something impossible and comes back and I don't know. I liked uh, I didn't mind Bane taking over the city the way he did. I thought that was it was it, they had too many ideas crammed in the movie. Kind of like some of the Raimi Spider-Mans in the in the uh, sequels. They they and and also in fact even the Joel Schumacher Batman movies where it's like one hero, one villain. That's all you need. And actually I guess it started with Tim Burton with mm-hmm. Batman Returns. It's like you, you don't need a twenty-five villains. It's like let's let's have it one on one. That's the best way to handle these things. Yeah, when they put too many characters in, it's just impossible to be with any of them emotionally because you don't. There's not enough story there. You're just kind of surprise. Here's the new. <laughs> Are you a Doctor Who person at all? Uh, I've watched a bunch of them. I can't say I do like Doctor Who, but uh, you know I've watched a ton of them and uh, you know tried to get into it, but I'm. I'm a moder- I'm, I'd say a moderate fan. I like it, but you know, I love I loved Karen Gillan on that show, and uh, oh yeah, um, you know, I like the Matt Smith ones. Me too. Christopher Eccleston. I don't know. Oh, I liked him. I liked him. Like Christopher El- Eccleston. Yeah, yeah, I liked him. I liked. Uh, I liked the idea of, and now I'm blanking. Um, uh, the last, the last guy. Uh, damn it, you know what I'm talking about. Um, Peter Capaldi. Peter Capaldi. Yes. I love the idea of him. I didn't think he got all the best scripts when he was playing the Doctor. And I like Jodie Whittaker right now, but as you were just saying, there's too many companions. There's four people running around with the Doctor. Four. And it's like, uh, that's that's too many companions, man. You, there's no time to talk for the Doctor to really do much. And I think that's been the, the big flaw in these two seasons we've gotten with uh, with Jodie Whittaker. So, you know. Those but are the uh, things I've seen... Those are the two. The I haven't seen those last uh, two doctors. I've missed out on those. But um, the problem I've always had with it is it. Uh, I, it feels like they're setting up some kind of like something sexual going on with like the young girl assistant, and there should be some sort of. But it's completely. There's like no hanky panky at all. And um, I know Karen the doctor is out there saying, "You idiot, <laughs> you don't get it." But I mean, I guess that's something that I thought. I don't know. Like. No, it seemed it seemed like Karen Gillan really wanted Matt Smith, and and that's fine, and it was cute as a something different. But I agree. I mean, that's fine. Well, let's uh, let me ask you about other franchises. Were you a, are you a Star Trek person? Uh, I have. Wa- I'm not like a. Um, I've watched. I've watched all of it, but I watched the Next Generation when it first came on, and I probably haven't seen. It, but I've seen. I've seen all of it. You know. Saw uh, the new stuff. Pardon me. Saw the, more- the new stuff. The new stuff I've seen, you know, I have stuff playing in my studio. So uh, Discovery and Picard, Discovery feels very much like the kind of, you know, uh, I think it's Akiva Goldsman and Roberta Orsi are doing that. And it feels like their stuff, their movies, it's like less, there's no real science fiction. It's mostly big emotional arcs, you know. It's weird that show, uh, the um, the Orville, is more hard-hitting sci-fi. Uh, you know, it, was, it raises interest, in, which blew me away. I don't know how you can't get sued for that. <laughs> You know, I'm just gonna like. Yeah, it's like Seth MacFarlane's fan fan fiction, but it, I love it, I, and it really, I think, smart. Took a, right? Yeah, it took a big leap forward, I think, in that second season. So, and I agree with you about um, di- y- current Star Trek does disappoint me because Star Trek used to lead trends, and it seems like in both Discovery and especially Picard, which I'm happy to watch Patrick Stewart just pace the floor. And call him John Luke Picard, and you, you, you say it again. You're unhappy with Picard. I've heard you talk. Oh, oh yeah, I know. I do it. I kind of like Discovery anyway. I like all the. I thought the actors were great. 
Actors are good. Fox's sister. Um, you know, I did like Picard. Uh, as someone who's less of a um, disciple, I'm a little easier with some of it. But I, I found later later on in the stories, like, uh, I don't know, I was really into it. I was really affected by, you know, Riker and uh, I'm forgetting. Oh, God, that's a, that's a great episode, yeah. And the lost, they lost a child. Just meeting these people again after all those years, there was such a melancholy to it. And just that story, you know, the old guy... And it's over and he comes back. It's like Batman return. It's bat it's the Dark Knight returns. It's like any given Sunday. Just that story of the guy who's washed up who comes back is like something I'm a sucker for, you know? Uh, so, I agree. Yeah. But I did love it. You know, I knew, you know, Riker was gonna show up at the end. I, I knew oh sorry. Uh <laughs> <spoiler> alert. <laughs> it's, again, people watching and listening to Word Balloon, they know I mean I, I covered every episode, absolutely. I had no pr- problem with Riker being there at the end, but leading the Armada. I'm like, Who isn't else? that like, you know, retired generals? Like, hey, we got to fight. Oh, okay, let me suit up and I'll join you. It's like, I don't think it would work that way. But, I mean, it was like, I don't mind it being part of the Armada. First That's one okay. on that speed dial is Riker. <laughs> and again, hey, it's great to see him. And it was, and especially after seeing him in the dumpy apron cooking pizza on the alien planet that, all right, now he's back in the uniform. And it's like, all right, that's Riker. Look at that, man. Now he's a badass and stuff. Everyone's life is just like they've just walked into a town and country uh, decorating magazine, you know, like <laughs> everyone's doing like, you know, gardening and uh, all this boring shit. And they- all, I mean, it worked. I mean, it was funny, but you're right about that. All the alien planets did look very town and country. So that's totally true. You're killing me, man. That's fantastic. What are like? And again, do you not have time to watch stuff because you you're making the donuts? Well, yeah. Like right now, you know, my wife is working at home. We got the kids at home, so I usually, you know, I'm working as much. I'm feeling very productive, uh, very uh, enthusiastic, but uh, I'm doing as much as I can in the hours that I've, I've got. Um, but yes, yeah, most of the time, the shows I'm watching are in the background, you know. So certain shows like. I don't think I could li- do like l- listen to like twin the new Twin Peaks or something in the <laughs> background, but like other shows I like. You know, I'm into this old Aaron Sorkin show. I've never really watched much. The Newsroom is is pretty cool. I enjoyed the news. Well, I enjoyed the first couple seasons of the Newsroom. Yeah. Last season, meh, you know, but that's all right. Halfway through the first season, you know, like great. I love the first season. I've been watching this kind of uh, old, The Blacklist, which is kind of this, uh, you know that show with James Spader? Sure. It sure does, and uh, I don't know if it's anyone's favorite show, but it's very easy to listen to while you're working. And uh, I haven't listened to or watched any kind of um, network shows where they're doing like 25 episodes a season, which is now really like three seasons worth of content. <laughs> and uh, there's some really good ones, and then there's some shitty ones. And it's really funny when you watch them next to you, like uh, back-to-back, like three episodes apart they're like using the same story mechanics and they have the repeating ideas and it's pretty funny but uh, they can deliver a lot of information quickly and uh i try i try to think about that when i'm doing my comics you know trying to make every page count so that's cool i agree with i agree with you in terms of where network tv is right now it's kind of what's driven me nuts about the cw shows where you've set up the big bad for the season but again you got to fill 22 episodes at least and you've got these bottle shows, these one and dones that have nothing to do with the big story. And it's like, OK, we know Barry Allen's going to fight Zoom. Can we get to that, please? Do we need to do this little stupid side story so close to the final act? And I agree with you. I, I'm i surprised it's taken so long for a lot of shows to uh, on, on the over the air networks to lower their uh, episodes to a 13 or 15 episode season and rotate in other shows. And I think the CW does that to a decent effect, but even their, their seasons are still a little too long. And I'm just surprised that the streaming and basic cable model hasn't taken over in terms of, uh, you know, like going to 13 or 15 episodes. Yeah. Right? Cause it kind of diminishes the overall series when you have more, you know, less polished ones, I guess, but yeah, uh, I don't know. Um, you know, Westworld's another one I really like. I don't know what the hell's going on sometimes, but I still like it. Me too. You know? Did you watch uh, yeah. Watchmen? Oh, The Watchmen. Uh, got it's got to be the the decade winner for comic book shows. Like it's it's such a that thing just landed so like it just landed this perfect little tone where it was 
like the book, but different than the book. It's not like aping what the book was doing, but uh, specifically what the book was doing, but it kind of had its own, like the book kind of starts out very street level and then grows to this gigantic thing. And they did that in the show really well. Um, the stuff with uh, uh, Adrian Veed, I think was so funny. Um, you know, where they take the memory, where she takes the, her grandfather's memories and they go back and uh, super powerful, like, um, yeah, I've never seen anything like it. It's, uh, it's, it's great. But I feel guilty watching it, too, because uh, uh, Alan Moore doesn't want me to do that. I, under I, I completely understand, and I feel conflicted about that, too. I, I always feel a little bit better when I talk to Dave Gibbons about it and stuff, because Dave's I okay with it. <laughs> uh, he's he's getting paid. Well, what I do is I have some Opus Dei Cat of Nine Tails, and I just kind of whip myself while I'm watching <laughs> I'm sure you do for your for your stories like Doc Frankenstein and Maestros. So I can appreciate that. That's outstanding, Ben. You're killing me. This is great. I um, did you watch The Boys on Amazon Prime? Yeah, that was amazing. That was so fun and watchable, and just like perfect timing for what people needed to see out of their superheroes. Um, yeah, I love that show. I thought it was great. I mean, um, I never read the book, but yeah, super super funny. Not too uh, erudite or anything, you know. It was kind of like uh, the more digestible Watchmen, you know. That's a that's an interesting take. I just loved how it really was a parody of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, both yeah. uh, as a as a you know a story, but also the marketing of Marvel movies. And I just loved that aspect of the boys and what Elizabeth Shue represented, being kind of the corporate head. And I thought that was really a great, brilliant stroke, and didn't expect it. And I and I'm I'm very excited to see season two. Uh, yeah, and I love the just like it has kind of a weird, pervy sense of humor, like the breastfeeding. Like you know, <laughs> it's so funny that people you know I, I got some ruffled feathers because I had a male erection in my Maestro's comic, but uh, there's no breastfeeding. <laughs> I drew drew a line in the sand. <laughs> This far and no father. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you, Picard. That's very good. I uh, No, I, that's cool. I'm trying to think of, uh, you know, again, I'm glad, I'm glad you liked Watchmen. I, again, I, how ambitious is that to, to even have the audacity after some of the failures like, you know, or the mixed re reception to before Watchmen and knowing that Alan Moore is watching and probably not, Couldn't or at least is aware and not happy. I do like that you brought up Dave Gibbons. You're right. I mean, he's also... You know, co-author. I mean, I, I kind of feel like the artwork is, and even though I've drawn Alan Moore's scripts, you know, he he worked uh, the Young Blood thing I did with uh, Liefeld was written by Alan, so I've I've done a bunch of his scripts, and you, and he lays it all out for you. Um, but you're still kind of the drawings are still working as kind of the, um, you know, the prose or the des descriptive language of a novel. You know, the they always there's always that. I always hear that uh, who's more important, the writer or the artist, uh, that uh, um, uh, that little um, debate. Debate, right. And uh, it's like they're one and, you know, they're kind of both the same. I mean, you can't, uh, they're this, that's the, the artist is drawing story. I mean, it's. Um, yeah, it's like it's like a, a screenwriter and, and a DP or a, a, direct, a film director because you're, you know, I mean, obviously the writer is providing what he wants in, in the visuals, but you're actually doing it. So you're doing, and not only that, but you're doing the acting. I mean, you know, no, of course they are. I see kind of the writer is more like the director and the artist is kind of like the actor and the studio and all the cameras and uh, craft service at my house. Anyway. <laughs> it's a big part of it. Well, and again, yeah, no, and it, it, hey, man, it takes the visuals to sell a book. I mean, it, you know, I, I absolutely, man, I, and especially, I mean, an attractive cover, but really, when you, you know, flip through the book and stuff, no, man, you, you're you're carrying, you know, eighty percent of the load, and that, I don't mean to diminish the writer. I, they should be, they should be equal. They should be considered well, equal. It, de you know, it depends. Like, you know, if I'm working with Brian Vaughn, clearly, I'm benefiting from his uh, position in the industry. You know, I haven't written hundreds of amazing comics, you know what I mean? Uh, of course, you know, it's all about your, your, your pedigree and what, whatever. So, um, 
but yeah, a lot of the time, you know, it's, it's a kind of a case by case basis, you know? Sure. Does the current status quo with diamond and distribution, would it make you consider like uh, what uh, Brubaker is doing? And and I want to say Marcos Medina with uh, panel syndicate, some of these other alternatives to, uh, you know, using the stores to get your, your book out there. Have you, have you thought about that moving forward? Well, what, are they, what are they doing exactly? I know they've got a new uh, downloadable thing through panel syndicate. Are they sending something to the stores as well? Or I think eventually they will, but right now, you know, you can buy episodically or not buy. actually they've got it completely like just buy the whole baby whole thing. Or if you, or even if, Hey, you don't want to pay anything, but you still want the story. They're like, okay. And luckily enough, good people are out there that are supporting the product and everything. And they, you know, but it's it's very and of course I want to say Marcos did uh, what was it with Vaughn Private Eye? He did a couple. He did one called Private Eye and he did one called Barrier and then he did a Walking Dead one shot that was about Rick Grimes' brother. Um, they're all great. I mean, yeah, Barrier especially. Well, not as good. actually Private Eye is amazing. Uh, so is the Walking Dead one. They're all really cool. Uh, would I do that? Yeah, I guess sure. I've got this arrangement with Image, so I guess I'll be doing that. But. Uh, you know, wherever the tide goes and I can make a living doing comic books, then I'll, I'll try to do that. I prefer to do that. You know, I spent a lot of years in movies and they were a lot of great life experiences and, and I love them, but I do wish I had, sometimes I look at, you know, you know, uh, you know, for some guys, that's all they wanted to do was to like design a robot for a movie or work on, you know, but for me, it was always, I wanted to do comics or do like a, I wanted to draw the X-Men when I was a kid. That was like, basically, you can do that and then you can die. Um, (laughs) So I wanted some kind of, you know, as I was in film for a few years, I sort of became a fan of comics again. I realized, well, this is what I really want to be doing. I'm sitting there working on Cats and Dogs 3 or something and wanting to kill myself. And I'm like, (laughs) wait a minute, why am I doing this? I I I do. Well, I'm friends with Gabe Hardman, and he's shared similar uh, storyboard stories with me. So yeah, man. No, I get it. Yeah, it's easier money, but it's uh, it's, it's hard to you gotta you know you you know what's your life worth? What's your time worth? You know. Uh, is there a lot of draw it again to in uh, movies? That's mostly what it is. Depending on what you're working on, uh, I've had times where I was left completely alone and I just drew whatever I wanted, and uh, it was more for um, you know kind of a first pass, so they could figure out what this script would cost. And there are other times, yeah, where I worked on that iRobot movie, you know, and it's like you were revising the same scene for six months. Wow. It's like so much money and the script is being written. It's like when it was one of those movies where like, you know, like three or four screenwriters and, uh, you know, it it was crazy. So it's not like it's fun at first, you know, and then you're like, okay, now we're going to change this and do that. And it's really about revisions. That's kind of for everybody, everybody, too, you know, concept guys. You're always, it's always, you're always changing things. So it's a good job for sure, but you can't beat um, drawing your own thing or drawing a great script from someone like Brian or, you know, whoever uh, that you like, whose work you admire. Uh, yeah, that's the best. That's cool. Now you mentioned you working with Alan Moore on Youngblood and stuff. And it was funny. I was telling you that uh, as we're recording this, I'll be uh, talking uh, within the hour uh, to uh, Rob Liefeld. And you were at Awesome Comics. Tell me about that experience. Oh, yeah, it was great. I think I was in L.A. for um, The Matrix. So before The Matrix had come out and they had just talked me out to – I worked on it for like a year over like a couple years' time where I'd come out for a couple weeks and I'd come out for a few months and then I'd go away. And every time I worked on it, by the time it wasn't going to get made. But during that period, I think Jeff Loeb had reached out. We had worked together and I was uh, – they were holding Spider-Man for me at Marvel – and, but I was working on my second or third tour on the first Matrix. And I was in L.A. and they said, well, come by the awesome comics. <laughs> and uh, I was out there. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so I got to go up to the office uh, and, and meet uh, Liefeld and meet um, Loeb and uh, get wooed at that time, you know. Uh, uh, but, yeah, I can I kind of I remember being very nervous meeting Liefeld for the first time because, uh, you know. He had accomplished a lot, and he was kind of like the guy I was looking at when I was a key, you know younger. So it was kind of cool and uh, working on uh, those characters. You know, there were a few bumps and stuff, but 
I don't know. It was, uh, I think it was a kind of a co pretty cool comic. Alan had a really funny take on those characters. Um, yeah, I didn't, let me try and think. One thing I remember is they had this big office building downtown LA and I remember driving by, I was with the Wachowskis in the car and uh, I was like, oh yeah, that's the building where I, I was. I had that meeting at for this new comic. And the building had like some big tarp hanging on it and I remember them just going, oh, uh, the building with that tarp? What's with that tarp? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I remember suddenly I started defending this building, and uh, oh, it was very nice inside. And it's not like they're just doing some work there. Anyway. Was it? I mean, obviously he's, you know, because he created awesome comics and stuff. It was the residuals of, of you know, that early image stuff that obviously exploded and gave him, you know, the the bank to uh, to kind of pursue these expansions and stuff like that. Was it? kind of internet startup in terms of the you know the things i've always heard about those in terms of like how what was the office environment like or you know was it a party well, was it Kirk stevenson who's the publisher of image was working there uh and i walk in and like uh Loeb and lifefield are signing uh, the captain america one thing they did remember lifefield he put like the bird uh, the yes forehead sure yes there's just like a million of these things and they're just like <laughs> signing these things and i come in there and uh they sort of wooed me, and uh, yeah, next thing you know, I was working for them. But then it all fell apart after like a couple months. Wow. Um, because they're in bed. I forget what happened, but it was like one of these times where everyone pulled out of comics. It looked like comics were dying again. And uh, so all these Fly By Night guys who were funding this particular version uh, pulled out version of Liefeld's comics, uh, yeah, they had just, yeah, just folded after like the third issue. I remember getting a call from Jeff Loeb. I remember being very funny, not expecting this at all. I was like, oh, are you calling about my raise? <laughs> and he was like, uh, this isn't the time to joke, Steve. <laughs> I was wow. Like, oh, shit. Wow. This is it. Wow. But, uh, but yeah, it was a bummer. Uh, yeah, he had so, so much fun stuff planned, but there you go. Interesting. Yeah, man. No, I, I find... I, 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 my, one of my biggest career regrets after that is I was offered... Uh, out of that came... ABC, America's Best Comics. But I was pretty young and dumb at that time. And rather than doing, I was offered top 10 first. Wow. And I went and did uh, Gambit at Marvel instead. <laughs> Which was a great experience. But, I'm sure it was. But, yeah. Well, G Gene Ha thanks you. <laughs> he, he, was, he did a better job than I could have on that. He did such an amazing job. I don't know, man. I could. I mean, that that seemed to be in your wheelhouse in terms of you know the way it was and everything. I'm talking over you again, but I, I could see you uh, doing top ten. But yeah, no, it was. Uh, yeah, those were good days, and I kind of got into the the movies for a while. Yeah. Understood. Absolutely. Well, I will let you go. I think we've had a lovely conversation. I I want people to uh, definitely uh, consider Maestros and Doc Frankenstein. Uh, available at your local comic shop. Uh, both great stories and uh, worthy of your attention. And uh, hey, man! I'm, uh, and also, of course, we we stand on guard when America invades Canada. Shit gets real. It might be. Uh, it might be. Uh, it's not a, a futuristic story. It's near future. It's like next week that's going to happen. Now, I just rewatched uh, the first Max Headroom pilot that they made for British TV. And it was Max Headroom 20 minutes in the future. And that's really what it was. So I can appreciate that absolutely from that kind of thinking Here. and stuff. I remember really wanting to see that show and watching it. And there was like all this time with these other characters and very little Max. And, uh, you know, anyway. <laughs> You're not wrong. You're not <laughs> wrong. It's uh, I liked, compared to the ABC Weekly show, I liked that they compressed it all in an hour i mean it's not even a full 90 minutes it's 57 minutes but it's i think a great like you know short little blip and and also it does focus on uh matt Furr's human character edison carter as much as it does i mean max really doesn't even show up until i think the start of you know the middle of act two so yeah i mean i, I hear what you're saying though yeah maybe, maybe a bit of a thin concept I, you know, uh, I read positive criti critiques of it, comparing it to Network meets the uh, Blade Runner. And again, on a, on a small TV budget, I, I there's some interesting ideas in that. Yeah, Network. So, I love that movie. I'll let you yeah. go. Yes, Steve. Honestly, thank you so much for doing this. Chatting with you, John.
always a pleasure. Please come back and uh, sooner than like you know the several years it's been between our conversations. And when you're ready with this new post-apocalyptic thing, please let me know. It was no, this is a great conversation. Okay. Thanks again for watching another Word Balloon video. We've got plenty more at our channel, Word Balloon. If you enjoyed it, please like it and consider subscribing to the channel. And of course, support me on Patreon, patreon.com slash Word Balloon. Thanks a lot for watching.